Hello everyone, hope you had a lovely lunch. Welcome back to the third panel of the day. Um, we're talking about the Irish Research Council postdoctoral scheme, the Levy Hume Trust Early Career Fellowship, I actually think it's called, and the British Academy Postdoctoral Fellowship. Um, again, I'll wait a few minutes until we get more attendees because it takes a little while for Zoom to filter everyone in. Um, but as before, you are being recorded, although we can't see your faces, so you don't need to worry about that, but just to let you know. Uh, okay, so it is five past, uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you're really welcome, for those of you who weren't here this morning, to panel three of our day on academic opportunities for after the PhD. I'm delighted to introduce three speakers for you this afternoon. We have Sarah Ahrens, Katie Mulligan and Livy D, who will be talking about the uh, Leap Hume Early Career, Irish Research Council postdoctoral scheme and the British Academy postdoctoral scheme. I also have Sophie Cooper assisting with the technology. Um, so thank you, Sophie. There are a few other housekeeping bets I'd like to go through, which again, apologies if you have heard this before, but you are being recorded. Well, the event is being recorded and will be put online afterwards. Um, it will go on my website and also on the Queen's Postdoctoral Development Centre's website. Um, I will introduce each of the speakers before their talk and they will go in the order listed on the programme. So Katie first, Livy second and Sarah third. And we will take questions at the end. And um, please put any questions in the Q and A box down below. Uh, please don't use the chat function for questions because they will get lost. Um, and we will answer all of these at the end of the three talks. Um, if you'd like to tweet about today's event, please do so using the hashtag ECRDay2021. And if you're uh, taking a screenshot of someone's slide, I'd ask you to please make sure that you tag or cite them. You should have everyone's Twitter uh, details again in the chat box. Um, thanks very much to Sophie Cooper for the technical support and to Queen's and UKRI for enabling me to pay today's speakers. Um, another quick point before we begin, at the end of the last panel, Sophie suggested that um, anyone who wanted to could use the hashtag ECR Day 2021 to talk a bit about the research and what they were interested in as a way of networking. Um, this took off uh, over lunch on Twitter and we have already had several established ECR, um, several established academics saying that if there are any ECRs that would like to get in touch to talk about collaborative ideas or project ideas, then please do. So do make use of that if you're on Twitter and haven't, um, because there are people on the lookout to help ECRs um, despite the general leave precarious nature of academia. Um, so I'll introduce our first speaker, which is Katie Mulligan. Um, so Katie Mulligan is an art historian specializing in 19th and 20th century Irish art. Uh, a graduate of UCD and TCD, following her PhD studies, Katie was the inaugural ESB fellow at the ESB Center for the study of Irish art at the National Gallery of Ireland and an Irish Research Council Government of Ireland postdoctoral fellow in the School of Art History and Cultural Policy at UCD. She now works in the Special Collections Unit at UCD Library and as an independent researcher. Her first monograph, Painting Dublin, 1886 to 1949, Visualising a Changing City, uh, was published by Manchester University Press in 2020 and will be published in paperback in October 2021, which is very fast because Katie Mulligan's research is so fabulous, it's sold hundreds and hundreds of books. Um, so Katie will be talking about the Irish Research Council, so I will hand over to you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much, um, Alison. I'm just going to bring up the screen. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's been such an enriching um, day so far. I hope I can um, add 
something more to it because uh, I think everything that has been raised so far, whether it's about applying or about kind of academic career trajectories more generally has um, been really honest and, and it's been such a welcoming and, and supportive environment to be a part of as well. So um, I'm going to speak specifically about um, the IRC's Government of Ireland postdoctoral fellowships. So these are a, a different scheme to the enterprise postdocs that Katie Mishler was speaking about uh, beforehand, but through the same funding um, body. I suppose just to, to start off, as I think we all ha um, have today, just to give you a sense of my background um, and where the IRC postdoc really um, slotted in to, to my career uh, so far. So I uh, did a BA in art history and English in UCD. Um, and then in, in the year following that, I was a graduate intern in the education department in the National Gallery of Ireland. So I suppose right from the beginning, um, I've kind of switched between um, kind of enterprise or industry settings and academic uh, settings as well. Following that, I did an, an MA in Trinity. And then again, I worked uh, the year following that as a research assistant in a small uh, research library within Trinity. I stayed on there then to do my PhD um, in that kind of awkward year between Viva and graduating. I was a teaching assistant in the history of art department in Trinity. Um, and then I did a two year, two and a half year fellowship in the National Gallery of Ireland, based in the ESB Centre for the Study of Irish Art. Uh, you'll see me there on, on the left with one of our amazing community groups and um, showing material, I think, from the Jack B. Yates archive there. Um, during that time, then I applied for IRC, returned to UCD for two years. Um, and so since I finished the fellowship in uh, October 2009, I've worked both as a freelance or independent uh, art historian or scholar and also since February 2020 um, as a library assistant in, in the UCD library. I think it, it's, I wanted to kind of go through that in full today because until I actually wrote it down, I hadn't even realised myself how kind of work in library and archives had actually been threaded throughout um, my career and kind of being interspersed uh, with my academic uh, work as well. Um, and so I suppose what, where I'm coming from talking about IRC fellowships is with one view to maintaining academic career and kind of keeping involved there, but also looking at how you can integrate or maybe lay a path for a non-academic um, academ job as well. Um, because this is something I think we all need to think about now. There are, you know, there aren't very many jobs, especially in the humanities, especially in other disciplines uh, like art history. So the earlier you can start embedding these alternatives within your career plan, I think um, the better as well. Um, when, so when I came to IRC, I had been out of, I suppose I'd been in a, a non, primarily non-academic job for almost two years. And um, I approached a mentor just over a month before the application was done. I was thinking, don't, but it worked out quite well. I had an established relationship with my mentor in terms of, of knowing her from within the discipline, though she had never been a supervisor um, before. I submitted my application in November 2016, I received the positive decision in April 2017, and the two year fellowship in October 2017. When I um, applied to the scheme, I had one period of article. Five period uh, publications. So these were uh, catalog essays um, and uh, kind of other other um, kind of general publications. And I also included on my application five con conference papers and two radio contributions because there is scope in the form to include these um, things. Um, the, with IRC, the publications that you include have to be in press publications, or at least in press, if not published. Um, so I think when I was doing the application, I had three book chapters that I was working on, but they weren't yet um, impressed. Um, and I just added this in this morning, just in terms of research awards and, and funding through your PhD, just to give people a sense of the I was that when I applied. I had PhD fellowship 
which was an Usher postgraduate fellowship from Trinity. Um, I had received a small travel grant from Trinity alumni to go to a conference and a small research grant from the Damon Junior Memorial Trust, which is a, um, a private funding body specialised in kind of um, arts and uh, visual art funding in, in I wanted to apply to IRC because really it is a flagship start in Ireland. It was in the title, it's it's the Government of Ireland um, uh, funding. It's open to applicants from outside of Ireland, but it does have to be within an Irish um, education institute or, or research programme office. So that's you know probably going to be one of the main universities um, on uh, in the Republic of Ireland. I was going to say on the island of Ireland, but no, in the Republic um, of Ireland. It attracts a lot of prestige because it's kind of the only one and because it's hugely competitive. I went through this morning and um, you can filter results on their website and say since 2015 to 2020, the number of awards made for this team has, it was about 80. There's a, a you know, a bit either side in, in different years. Um, and it is split between the sciences and arts, humanities and social sciences with roughly a 50-50 split between. There's no information on about how many applicants uh, there are, but I'm, I'm gonna go uh, ahead and say that it, it's a lot more than 80. It attracts a very good salary. I think at the moment it's around it, there was an increase this year, it's around 38,000 euro. And you also get excellent research expenses. And this is one of the great um, benefits of the IRC scheme. You get 5,000 euros per year uh, for your research expenses. And this can cover everything from laptop um, other, and other equipment, stationery, and it can cover travel, and it can cover open access fees and, and image uh, rights as well. You have no uh, requirement to undertake teaching. You, you can take a limited amount of teaching. You have to tell the IRC that you're doing it. Um, and it also gives you a really good uh, basis for professional development um, through your institution. So if you're thinking about applying for IRC, in line with really all of the other schemes that we've looked at in uh, the previous um, talks, you need to give yourself plenty of time uh, to think about this. Uh, don't start a month beforehand. You need to check you're eligible. Um, you can apply up to five years uh, from the date of your PhD uh, graduation. Um, and then you need to start sketching out your research proposal. At an early stage, you need to think about who and where. Um, so mobility was a kind of a, a part of the form in previous years it was when I applied it isn't now but it's definitely worth thinking about you know do you want to stay at the institution you did your PhD on if you're com if you're coming from an Irish institution are you going to move and who is your um, mentor going to be other things to really consider is what kind of institutional support you're going to have so this starts with the research office who will probably be your first uh, port of call what kind of professional and career development are you going to have and what's available to you in terms of a peer network so just for example in ucd you would the research office do workshops and they give you an application pack for applying for irc there is a a, a program of career development for um postdoctoral fellows and say for example in terms of peer network i was based in the humanities institute in an office with other postdoctoral fellows and that is a key um, thing to have when you're thinking about you know where you're going to be based who will you have around you because you don't want to be on your own and um, doing a postdoc in terms of a mentor um what I will say, and this is something that my own mentor said at our very first meeting, was that your relationship with a postdoctoral mentor is different to that of your PhD supervisor. There is kind of a feeling that you have finished your PhD, you should be able to stand on your own two feet in, in a lot of ways. Your mentor is there maybe not so much for subject specific guidance, but there for career guidance, publication guidance, or at least that's certainly the relationship that I agreed uh, with my um, mentor. And a really important thing, I think, from an, at, when you're at that first stage is to ask to read other proposals. I'm always happy to share uh, my proposal, though it's a little bit out of date now. But some careers offices do keep a bank of these that you can consult as well. Um, 
this is just kind of more of these things to check your eligibility, you know, and um, what kind of project is it going to be? What will the mentorship style be? What support will you have? Um, a key aspect of the IRC at the initial stage is deciding whether you want to apply for a one or two year uh, fellowship. And um, we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in just a few um, minutes. This is a very rough outline of the form. Now elements do change every year, but I think when you lay it all out like this, you can see that what you might think of as the most important part of the um, application, the project details. So this is actually what you're going to research. This is one of four chunks that you need to do. So there is your eligibility, your mentor, your referee, your qualifications, achievements. There is a career and training development plan, your work experience, your publications, a personal statement, an ethical statement, um, a data management plan, which again, that's a new addition to it and other declarations. So you need, this isn't just about um, the project plan, but it's about every, it's about the whole package as well. And you need to consider that. In terms of the one or two year fellowships, these are the definitions from the IRC's own website. And so you can see here, the purpose of the one year fellowship is to prepare a doctoral thesis for publication through a variety of high quality published outputs. These might include, for instance, a monograph, peer reviewed journal articles, or contributions to edited volumes, or a combination of the above. And with that, if you're applying for one year fellowship, you have to give a publication plan which includes specific publishers and journals. So that could be the publisher you're going to submit your monograph to, the titles of journals you are, are submitting articles to. With the two year fellowship, then, this is in order to develop either a new research project or a research project that demonstrates a significant development of the subject of the doctorate through a variety of appropriate, feasible and clear published outputs. And you have to uh, give an outline of what a significant development is. This is the option I went for, the two year fellowship, which was a uh, with a significant development of my PhD uh, topic. And so just to, I think, even I was like, God, a significant development. What, what exactly does that entail? This is the section from my um, application form where I outlined the significant development. It's not very uh, long, but really what I took my need from was the feedback given by my external examiner, which encouraged me to take a broader context for considering um, my topic and developing two particular uh, chapters um, of it, which would then recast the findings um, as a whole in a more um, kind of expansive um, expansive way. So obviously, there, you know, you never know exactly what has pu pushed your application over the line, but this certainly, for me, this was enough of a significant development from my previous research. This then, and, and I'm sorry for having such kind of text laid in the slide, but just to show you that there are differences in terms of pro proposed research for the one and two year application. And um, with the two year application, you're including abstracts, um, more on kind of uh, design methodologies, product planning. Um, there's some a Gantt chart uh, for both. If you haven't done one before, you'll find lots of YouTube um, help, help. And just a kind of explaining any research trips, why you're choosing the proposed institution and why you're choosing your proposed mentor as well. So here is just a comparison between what I proposed in my application and then what I actually did during the fellowship, because certainly from my experience, these were two very different um, things. So in my application, I said I would do two papers at an international conference and or international conferences. And I think these were the main association conferences for my subject. I would have two international research trips. They were going to coincide with the two um, conferences, uh, an exhibition proposal um, for a national cultural institution, one peer reviewed journal article and to prepare um, a book manuscript that would be ready to submit to the publisher by the end of the fellowship. So they were my five, five things that I was going to do across the two years. This is what I actually uh, did. I wrote two peer reviewed journal articles, um, a chapter for an edited collection. I did two short 
um, pieces for non-academic publications. Um, and that was really because the exhibition that I had wanted to propose actually was put on by someone else. So I wrote two articles about those instead. Um, I did two international research trips. I did a book proposal, the book manuscripts, um, nine conference papers, seminars, and guest lectures. And this kind of group, it had included obviously the two kind of main conference papers I wanted to give. But also when you're in a research institute like the Humanities Institute, you get invited to give papers, lunchtime seminars, be part of people's maybe um, career development days. So they do um, add up um, a little bit. Um, and through the same network, I helped uh, co-organize co uh, two um, symposiums. You see the poster there for one of them. Um, I also did a Marie Curie application and I thought that um, what Anna Delader was saying earlier was so important, I rushed it. I by the end of my IRC, or kind of the last summer of my IRC, I was panicking. I put together a proposal at the last minute, I didn't get it. Um, but I think if I had given more time, um, it, it would have been uh, better. Maybe I'll come back to it. And of course, in amongst that, it's a two-year position. You are going to spend such a chunk of your time, especially in the last year, um, applying for other jobs and fund applications. And it does take time. It takes, you know, you. I think we all, and see that as an extra job, where actually, if you're on a short, uh, a fixed term contract, it is a huge part of your job. I remember when I was in my two year job in the National Gallery, um, a very senior member of the team said to me um, that a two year contract is great because you get to spend a year enjoying the job and a year applying for your next one. And I think that's really true, um, no matter what kind of a two year position you are in. And obviously, if you're in a one year position, it's you know, it's an, another scenario altogether. So what I would say, if you're thinking about applying for IRC, there are some things um, that can help along the way. But again, even as uh, Sarah Cummins said in, in the very first talk, there is an element of luck, um, of privilege, of um, being in the right place at the right time. But things that maybe you can think about are your research achievements, maybe any dissertation prizes, any funding awards. And it really, if it's 50, pounds or 50 euro to go to a conference that's a funding award it accounts any of your relevant um, teaching experience or work experience so that's teaching tutoring um, any research assistant work that you might do so say during my PhD I did some freelance work as a research assistant for a major publication and um, uh, the art and architecture of Ireland, which is like a almost a dictionary a project with four four or five volumes. I did some research assistant work for that, which was great. Um, and then any enterprise or industry uh, of employment, that's how it's going to be phrased in a, in a grant, in grant speak. Um, so obviously then that was my work with the National Gallery. Um, and then just, you know, thinking about what kind of outputs you can uh, put onto your application form. It is intense. There's, um, I think that's come through with all of the different schemes we've looked at today, that it, applying for these things is time consuming and um, but that's not a reason not to do it and I had such a great time during the two years of my RSC fellowship because um, you're never going to get that kind of um, research focused time again if you go into um, a, a lectureship position you might get a month in the summer but you you know you're always going to have committee work teaching and pastoral care coming up so this is two years really of very focused research time. Going through the application alone will really make you think if, about whether you want to continue down an academic route because you know it, it is very involved. Before COVID, something like this fellowship gives you huge scope for travel. And so if you've been looking at my photos uh, the whole way through, these are all places that I got to go to um, during, um, during the fellowship. Um, having the research fund for any art historians out there, if you are publishing a monograph um, based on your PhD research, your image costs will be huge. Um, so through the research fund from the IRC, I was able to cover um, copyright costs, image file costs, part of the subvention um, for the book. So you might think it's going to be important. You might think it's important now if you're just in the final stages of a PhD, but it will be down the road. And also then all of the career development that you can do during the fellowship for non-academic um, jobs. So the 
again, I would just, I was thought um, Katie Mishler in the enterprise session did such a good job about of uh, explaining about transferable skills and how you can identify these within your PhD and postdoctoral work. What I would also just echo is to use the career office. Um, and you, even though yes, we're all working towards this idea of maybe being an academic, you cannot rely on the academic job market. So since I finished my PhD, two permanent lectureships in my fields have been advertised. I finished my PhD in 2015. Um, and there have been very few other posts in art history or visual culture departments in Ireland. And I, because my family is here, my life is here, I, I want to stay here. And that's a really important decision for me as well. And Sarah Coleman talked about that at the start as well. So how can you kind of help yourself along the way? Well, you can bake these non-academic jobs into your research uh, through placements, internships, collaborations, and, and a side hustle. Um, and I know, especially around internships, there's a lot of baggage that comes there with um, financial security and being able to do with them. It is easier, I think, for uh, art history graduates um, to pivot into to glams or gallery, galleries, libraries, archives, um, museums. But something I think is really important is that these are also highly competitive fields. There are issues in terms of precarity and flex from contracts in these fields as well. And they're interest, industries with um, multiple entry pathways. So, you know, just because you maybe have a, a PhD in a relevant area, there will be people who have done professional qualifications such as um, library and information studies, curatorial um, MAs. And also something I think to keep in mind is that what is a, a maybe a, a second option for you is someone else's first option as well. And um, so there is just there is a little bit of navigating expectations um, when you pivot into another industry. And this really came through in the Q&A in the at the end of the last session is that moving into a non academic job after your PhD does not reflect negatively on you or your research. It's it's a, making a conscious decision about what you want from your life um, and that can be having more security um, more stability uh, and not kind of relying on on making a, a career out of piecemeal bits and pieces. Just to highlight some transferable skills and these are things that I have drawn on when I moved into my current role and um, things like project management. I was very lucky in UCD you can get a certification in project management as a postdoc and budget management, you have managed your funding applications, you've managed your research budget, you have done extensive stakeholder relationship and stakeholder management, whether with your mentor, with people you're collaborating with, maybe if you've supervised students, you are an extremely qualified event organizer and through the conferences and workshops that you organize as a PhD student and as a postdoc, you know how to identify and achieve goals and you have great analytical skills, attention to detail, administration, self-motivation and initiative. So it's, and it's something that is difficult, especially when you're in the thick of it, but to sit back and think, what are the things that I have learned that aren't um, directly related to my research? So just a few um, kind of final uh, points then. Um, you are eligible to apply for IRC up to four years post PhD and you can apply twice. So there's no rush, you can take a year you can take two years and think about um, how you're going to strengthen your application and, and, in, and increase your chances for success. You can apply for small funding grants and scholarships in the meantime. And um, these are some quite, um, I suppose, arts and humanities specific ones or even art history specific ones uh, and even Ireland specific at that as well. But every, every discipline has these kind of, you know, small grants that you can apply for. You can keep publishing. So I finished my, um, IRC two years ago and I have kept publishing um, and I really feel that even if I don't end up moving back into an ac academic uh, position I will always publish because I love my subject and even if it isn't my main job I'm always going to want to write about it and share that and um, as other people have said network 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 throughout your PhD throughout your postdoc and um, and if you find yourself with this little bit of time maybe a two-year fellowship think about um, and plan for your alternative um, academic job options um, throughout. 
I am always happy to talk to people who are who are kind of going through um, these phases. You can reach out to me on Twitter. You can send me an email. Um, but I suppose just to sum up, I think some of the things that I've heard today, I think that idea of taking ownership of your choice. Um, I remember really clearly um, when I didn't get an interview for something, sitting with a very senior scholar in my field, and they said, they're like, oh, you just need to do the kind of bits and pieces for a few more years. And I was like, I'm 31. I, I want to, you know, have a life. I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. And really, as soon as I said that to myself, it made it a lot easier to start looking at alternatives. So you've got to do what is right for you and, and kind of, um, you know, take ownership of that. It can be hard to move into a non-academic job. And um, there are the same um, issues around employment in terms of personalities. Nothing is, is easy, but it, it can be done. There will always be an element of being at the right place at the right time. Um, so say, for example, uh, with the pandemic, if I if if the pandemic had come six months earlier, I would be in a very different place, a very negative place and bad place to where I am now. And ultimately, you have to prioritize what works for you. And um, you have one life and, and you have to live it. And um, so I hope that is useful, both in terms of applying for IRC, giving you a sense of what the fellowship involves, um, and maybe then different career uh, paths afterwards as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll hand you over back to Alison. I am back. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. That was fantastic. I loved your parting words of wisdom as well about us living our one life to the full. Uh, thank you. Um, now we are moving on to Sarah Ahrens. Delighted to introduce Sarah Ahrens to you, who is Sarah is currently a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in French uh, at the University of St Andrews, working on the histories and narratives of sciences and their role in Belgian colonialism. She's also working on a book project on the post-colonial condition of the city of Brussels for Liverpool University Press. So I'll hand over to you and uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, thanks so much, Alison. Let me um, just try to share my PowerPoint as well. Um, can you see this? Uh, yes. Yeah, great, okay. Well, um, hi everyone, and um, I'm feeling very humbled and grateful to be part of this excellent panel and also the papers this morning. Thanks so much for having me. And um, please bear with me as well. I will say a lot that has been said already, so there's, there's going to be a lot of repetition, but um, <clears throat> hopefully shows that there's uh, all these different fellowships have a lot in common. And um, But I thought I'll begin my um, presentation today by uh, talking a bit about my own background and how I came to apply for, for this particular one. So um, I was born in Germany and I grew up both there and in Nigeria where my dad is from. I'm from a non-academic working class background. I went to a state school and my first degree was a German magister degree in French, English literature and American studies from Saarland University in Southwest Germany. After that, I worked as a part-time research and teaching assistant in French at the University of Duisburg-Essen because I first thought I'll do a PhD in Germany and as, also as a freelance translator in Berlin. Um, nothing exciting. I was working for a marketing agency at that time and I didn't want to do a PhD in Germany and I decided to apply for um, scholarships in the UK to have basically to have a paid job for three years and I was lucky enough to get a university scholarship from Edinburgh as well as a German one and I ended up doing a PhD in French at Edinburgh um, with a brief stint in France and I finished in 2017. Um, to give you a brief idea of where I was by the time I applied for the BA, um, I submitted the application a year and eight months after my viva while I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities at Edinburgh, which was a 10 month fellowship, um, which was my first research focused position post PhD. Um, but because that didn't pay enough and that money had to last over the summer, I also did a maternity cover at Glasgow that was teaching only. Um, before this, I had various short term positions after my PhD, the longest was a nine month lectureship in French at St Andrews and I'll come come back to this later. But um, I'd, I'd also worked pretty much throughout my PhD I taught French, 
I had several administrative jobs and I was also very briefly towards the end a teacher at a French school in Edinburgh where I lasted only four weeks and was very much confirmed in my choice to never become a school teacher ever. Um, by the time of application, I had um, two journal articles out and two in preparation, two book chapters and some other publications like reviews. And again, I'll come back to this. Um, I had submitted my book proposal, but I hadn't heard back yet. Um, before I talk you through the BA application process, I would like to join my fellow presenters um, who have talked about rejections this morning and show you this. Um, so I started applying for jobs and research fellowships towards the end of the second year of my PhD. And until today, I have received 53 rejections and only six of my applications have been successful. Um, plus two grant applications I applied for with colleagues that I have not included here. As you can see, the majority of research focused jobs and research fellowships I have applied for were immediately rejected and didn't even go through to a second or an interview round. And I think that's um, like everyone else, I think it's important that when we talk about our successes to also talk about our failures and rejections and how to find a way of dealing with this um, is also part of the process. Um, I have included all this to give you a bit of background of how I've approached this world that I've ended up in um, more or less by accident. Um, the system is flawed, unfair and heavily rewards existing privilege, but I've still experienced this as very a very rewarding space to be in, especially compared to other jobs I've worked in. Um, and I would very much like to support what um, a lot of other people have already said earlier. Um, but let's move on to the actual BA fellowship. So here's um, what I think is important to know before applying. Um, the BA fellowship is a three year fellowship with your own project. And it has a very strong focus on research rather than public engagement, just to differentiate it from other existing schemes. You apply through a host institution of your choice, and I'll come back to this, and it works in a way that the BA pays 80% of your salary, and the host institution only pays 20%, which makes the BA particularly attractive for them. The BA also provides you with um, £6,000 of research expenses for three years, so not every year, um, but like over the course of three years. Um, and some teaching is expected, which I think is limited to about seven hours a week, which is still quite a lot, but this is really dependent on your personal circumstances, as in how much teaching you've already, how much teaching experience you already have and um, or need because fellows have usually very, very different backgrounds and levels of teaching experience. Um, the fellows, so for example, I had lots of teaching experience before I started this, so I tried to focus only on the kinds of teaching experience that I hadn't really had already, such as, you know, supervising a master thesis, things like that. Um, the fellowship also includes a buyout for a mentor, and um, that's also something I'll talk about uh, at a later stage again, but and as um, Katie, I think, already mentioned, this is a relationship that's not like the one you might have had with your PhD supervisor, but just someone keeping an eye on the progress of your project and who should support you during the application process and who's there for general academic advice. The application process consists of two rounds of written applications. So after the first round, you get either rejected or you get invited to submit a full application that also includes all the financial details. And um, you also get the chance to update your CV, your um, publications and that. So for example, if there are any new ones, you can add them. Um, there's no interview and unfortunately, there's also no feedback. Um, the first deadline is usually mid to late October. The deadline for the second round is usually February, and you will learn about the outcome of the application in June. So you see it's a, it's a very drawn out process as well. Um, as with um, other applications, it's really important that you check whether you're eligible before putting in all the work. You can apply if you're a British citizen or a national from the European economic area. Um, anyone from any nationality, as long as you have a PhD from the UK, 
or if you have what they call a strong prior association with the UK academic community. And what they mean by that is basically um, if you've worked at least for a year post PhD in the UK at a UK university, but double check this. Unfortunately, the BA has um, a very narrow definition of what they consider early career status. So you have to be within three years of the date of your viva. So importantly, this is the date of your viva, not the date of you having received the PhD. However, you can contact them about an exemption from this rule. Um, as with the other fellowships, there are some um, exemptions from this. And um, also, unfortunately, you can only apply once. Um, and this is important. So you can't apply again if you get rejected. And therefore, some people tend to wait until the end of the eligibility period so that they will have accumulated as many publications and other funding as possible before applying to um, enhance their chances. I didn't quite do that. I applied about a year and eight months after my Viva, but um, I do think it's relatively rare, although does happen um, that someone receives a BA fellowship straight out of their PhD, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, the BA has the reputation of being rather traditional in their choice of research projects, but I don't think this is necessarily true. Um, while my own project is quite traditional, so it's based pretty much entirely on archival research and historical methods, many of my cohort's colleagues' uh, projects are really not, and they're super innovative in terms of their approach and content. Um, what I do think, however, is really crucial when applying for this fellowship is to show that your PhD project is done and dusted. And... Um, a way to do this, to show this, is to um, have a contract for, um, uh, for your first book by the time of application or to show that you have engaged in disseminating the findings of your PhD um, in other ways, for example, through a series of articles. At the same time, make sure that you strike a balance between maxing out on the amount of publications you have, especially peer-reviewed articles in good journals, but remaining within this relatively narrow eligibility period. Also, I think it's a good idea to try and build a funding track record before applying to the BA to demonstrate that you have moved on from your PhD and that you're safely engaged in postdoc work. And that this work already attracts funding, for example, by applying for shorter postdoctoral schemes, such as the Leverhulme study abroad studentships, uh, Marie Curie, the Irish Research Council, Alexander von Humboldt in Germany, and so on and so forth, before applying to the BA, because um, what they want to see, what they really want to see is a certain maturity of thought and your ability to show that you already have spent some time developing this project idea and can hit the ground running. What's really important as well is to show a strong fit, like with most of the other ones as well, a strong fit with your host institution. For example, are there any research centers or archives that are particularly important or can you make them important to your project? Are there any other research or reading groups um, you can engage with and demonstrate how not only you would benefit from being in this place, but also how this institution would benefit from having you there. If possible, try to show that you've already have a good working relationship with your future mentor. For example, in my case, I had worked at St. Andrews before, this nine month lectureship. So I could state that I had already developed a relationship with a person who would then become my mentor. Make sure that they are sufficiently senior and or have a standing in your field, a certain standing in your field. They don't have to work, and I think this is really important, they don't have to work on exactly what you're doing, and um, that could potentially be quite difficult anyway, um, but they should be in a position to give you expert advice. If um, you are not already in um, at the place, or if you, if you struggle to, to demonstrate this kind of existing relationship, um, you could ask your future mentor, for example, to invite you to give a talk prior to your application to show that you are already engaging with each other. And finally, I would say choose your mentor wisely, same as with your PhD supervisor. Um, you um, have to be able to work with them for an extended period of time. And um, 
So take your time to get to know them before applying. Same with a host institution, and I'm happy to respond to any further questions about this as with anything else I'm talking about um, in the Q&A. But um, let's move on to talk about the key section of the proposal that is your project description for a moment. Um, what is important is that you come up with a project that matters, basically what Livy was already talking about. So what I mean by this is you should be confidently able to respond to questions such as, as Livy already said, like, why this project? Why now? Why you? What skills do you bring to it? Um, and um, what skills are you going to develop? Um, what I think is crucial is not only to demonstrate that this is not just an extension of your PhD, but that it is at the same time a project that shows momentum and organic growth out of your PhD. Um, as I've mentioned before, be strategic about this and um, think about when would be a good time to apply. And I'm very well aware that because it was the same case for me, the way that the job market is, there isn't always an ideal time to do this. Um, but um, it's important to show a strong fit with your host institution and wider location. So, for example, are there any museums, galleries, archives? Um, etc in the city or in the wider region as well where you decide to apply for this fellowship that could help you to showcase a strong fit. Um, take time, this is really going to be a full time job for a few months, practice your ideas and get feedback on both the proposal and the application form as a whole. Some institutions offer an internal selection process and make sure you look up the, the dates for that because they might be well earlier than the um, uh, BA deadline. And um, St. Andrews didn't have one when I applied, but when I applied earlier with a different project for um, a Leverhulme Fellowship at Bristol that I didn't end up getting, I really benefited from the internal selection process. So I got feedback from members of staff from different disciplines. And while I ended up working on a different project, um, I've still got this one on the back burner, so to say, and I will work on it at a later point. Um, but for now, I'd like to talk about this practicing in a bit more um, in a bit more depth. Um, so develop your funding application writing style. And what I mean by this is to develop an appropriate language that is confident but not cocky. And in particular, um, the application form starts with an abstract where you have to very concisely, very clearly sum up what your project is about. And this is your elevator pitch. So, um, and this elevator pitch is something you really need to practice over and over again, rewrite it over and over again. Um, have it read by different people. Um, get friends who are not academics to read it and see if they understand what your project is about, because this is really how you grasp the selection committee's attention and tickle their interest. Make sure you have clearly, really clearly set out research questions and objectives and then ambitious but realistic plan of action, meaning you have three years what you're going to do with them. Um, shape your project accordingly so, so it can be done within this time frame. Um, it's really important to have very concrete plans for publication as well. What are you going to publish, where and when, at what points in the project? I do recommend reading previous successful applications. This has helped me a lot to get a sense of the right tone required. And if the institution you are applying through has had Bridge Academy Fellows in the past, they might be able to provide you with um, successful applications or get you in touch with people who are currently um, or have recently been BA Fellows. And um, yeah, ask them very politely if they were happy to share their form with you. Um, they might not. Um, and that's okay too, because it's um, unpublished research. So um, don't, be, don't be angry if they don't, if they say no. And obviously I don't have to tell you this, but don't copy anything. Um, keep in mind that especially people who are currently fellows are being asked a lot for their applications. So um, last year, I think I received about 30, 35 requests of people who wanted to see mine. So be aware that um, you're not the only one reading this and um, which should give you obviously even more reason not to copy anything. And um, 
Finally, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, doing a PhD, um, you know that community matters. And so I really encourage you that when you're developing a research proposal, um, be that for the BA, but literally for any other scheme as well, get feedback. Um, get feedback from peers and of course, um, of course, but also importantly from people in related but different disciplines. For example, if you're like me in modern languages and um, also kind of dipping into history, get feedback from someone in philosophy or in English literature or in politics. And um, because keep in mind that the people who are going to read your proposal and judge it might not necessarily be experts in your particular field or discipline even. Get feedback from the person who's going to be your future mentor and they will be able to also get you in touch with the local research and finance offices. Um, for the BA, the support from the finance office um, to calculate the details of your bid comes at the second stage, so you don't need that at the first one, but nevertheless, they are important people to know. And remember, importantly, you can always negotiate your salary, and this is a normal and common thing to do, especially if you've been out of your PhD for a few years and you have probably quite a lot of um, extensive experience in teaching and research. Um, challenge them not to hire you just on the lowest spinal point of their postdoc scale. They might still do this, but at least you've tried. And from my own experience, it's really always worth it. Um, and of course, I would also encourage you all to, be, uh, to become union members. They're also in a position to offer you advice and um, support for these negotiations. Um, other than that, join reading groups, writing groups, practice your work in front of others. And finally, something I did as well, which I found quite useful was uh, when developing my, my postdoc work was to publish a kind of transitional article um, that helped me to, to order my thoughts of how to move on from my PhD. Um, and then, yeah, don't look, don't look at success rates, um, work on a project and then get your application in. Um, even if it's not successful, you have a very well put together project that you can use for another funding body. And um, I hope this has been useful. Please feel free to get in touch, um, ask about anything. I'm happy to read stuff, give you feedback on that. Um, ask about anything I've, uh, might, I've brought up or might have forgotten about. But yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you very much.